presents for you with our highest honor, the George Washington Award. Please come forward. understand where we stand in the sweep of American history. What the current administration represents is the full and one hopes final flowering of the progressive impulse that began with Woodrow Wilson. Came into further flourishing under FDR's New Deal, grew still more under the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson and now is a project about to be, they think, completed. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson was the first American president to criticize the American founding. The first American president to say the founders got it wrong. He said they got it wrong because they did not design an efficient government. And he's right. They went to create a safe government. To which end? They created three branches of government, two branches of a legislative branch, supermajorities, veto, veto overrides, judicial review, a government full of blocking mechanisms to make the government slow down. Now, some people say this leads to gridlock. Of course it does. Gridlock, ladies and gentlemen. An American achievement. <laughs> the basic progressive impulse has always been concentrate more and more power in Washington and more and more Washington power in the executive branch and more and more executive branch power in the hands of unaccountable experts and we will be well governed. We will not be well governed until we understand the stark dichotomy here. The founders believed that we had pre-existing natural rights that were in no way created by government, and the rights were to enable us individually to pursue happiness. The new dispensation from the progressives is that the government is the fountain, the source of our rights. It creates our rights, and it will deliver to us happiness wrapped in a brown paper parcel. I don't think so. I think we've seen what's happened in the world. Their method, their idea that the society is best run by commands by an elite from above with a monopoly on information has been rejected. The American model, as we normally have understood it, the maximum dispersal of decision making, markets deciding wealth and opportunity, is that toward which the American people are, I believe, determined to claw back, and we will. Winston Churchill, who loved our country as much as he loved his American mother, said the American people invariably do the right thing after they have exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> I think the American people still believe that a benevolent government is not always a benefactor, that capitalism doesn't just make us better off, it makes us better. I think they understand that when Jack Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, one thing you can do for your country is to reserve a spacious portion of your life for which your country is not responsible. Went when he said, take any three letters from the alphabet, doesn't matter which ones, pick them at random, put them in any order you want, it doesn't matter, you will have an acronym designating a federal agency, we can do that. <laughs> Understand what the poet Robert Frost meant when he said, I do not want to live in a homogenized society, I want the cream to rise. Yeah. I understand what Ronald Reagan meant when he said, I do not want to go back to the past, I want to go back to the past 
way of facing the future. Rogers Hornsby, the greatest right-handed hitter in the history of the <laughs> was at the plate one time in the early 20s, and there was a rookie pitcher on the mound who was quite rationally petrified. <laughs> the rookie threw three pitches to Hornsby that he thought were right on the edge of the plate, but the umpire said, ball one, ball two, ball three. The rookie got flustered and shouted, and says, umpire, those were strikes. The umpire took off his mask, looked out at the rookie, and said, young man, when you throw a strike, Mr. Hornsby will let you know. Rogers <laughs> Hornsby had become the standard. If he didn't swing, it wasn't a strike. <laughs> that is basically the American point. We are all free to define excellence and to become the embodiment of excellence. No one else defines it for us. 1858. Abraham Lincoln. War clouds lowering over the country. Spoke at the India at the Wisconsin State Fair. And he told the story, he said, of the Oriental despot who summoned his wise men and gave them an assignment to go away and not return until they had a proposition to be carved in stone, to be forever in view and forever true. They returned to him and the proposition they had was, this too shall pass away. How consoling, said Lincoln, in time of sorrow. How chastening in time of pride. But, said Lincoln, it need not be true. If Americans, he said, cultivate the physical, the moral world within us as assiduously and creatively as we cultivate the physical world around us, it need not be true. Americans for prosperity exist on the principle that when you change the nature of a nation's economy, you change the national character in the process. And we will not sit still for it. <laughs> the dependency agenda and the entitlement mentality that fuels it can be reversed. It's a matter of hitting the elite button. It's a matter of hitting the streets and the sidewalks. It's a matter of hitting the polling booths, and you, as Michelle Bachman said, are the point of the lance. Go to work. <laughs>